A Lesson Before Dying, Chapter 3. My gray 46 Ford was parked in front of the house. Tom Lou in her black overcoat and black rimless hat, and Miss Emma in her brown coat with the rabbit fur around the collar and sleeves and her floppy brown felt hat, followed me out to the car and stood back until I had opened the door for them. Not only was I going up to Henry Pico's house against my will, but I had to perform all the courtesies of a chauffeur as well. After they had settled in the back seat, filling it completely, I slammed the door and went around to the other side and got in. I could feel my aunt's eyes on the back of my neck for shutting the door as I did. Miss Emma probably would have looked at me the same way, but her mind was on other things. As I drove by the church where I taught school, I thought about all the work I had to do, and I reminded myself that I had to see one of the men on the plantation about getting a load of firewood for the heater. I tried to remember who had brought us the last wagon load of wood. Fifteen or twenty families sent their children to the school, and I always made it a point. They expected it of me, to ask them to do something for the school during the six-month session. I would ask one of the older children to tell me who had bought in the, brought in the last load of wood. I stopped at the side gate to Henry Pico's large white and gray antebellum house. When my aunt started to get out of the car to open the gate for me, I told her to keep her seat because I had nothing to do all that day but serve. I felt her eyes on the back of my neck again, then on the side of my face as I pushed open the gate and on me directly as I came back to the car. After driving into the yard, I had to get out again to shut the gate. Since the side entrance led from the quarter to the house, Henry Pico never used this gate. Only tractors, wagons, and trucks used this entrance. And over the many years, they had cut just as many ruts across the yard. I must have hit every one of them, driving up to the house. My aunt never said a thing, but I could feel her eyes on the back of my neck. I was not aiming for the ruts but I wasn't avoiding them either. I could hear them bouncing on the back seat, but they never said a word. After parking under one of the great live oaks not far from the back door, I turned around to look at my aunt. Am I supposed to go in there too? She looked at me, but she didn't answer me. She thought I had hit those rets on purpose. It was you who said you never wanted me to go through that back door ever again. Do I have to keep reminding you, Grant? This ain't just another day. He don't have to go, Miss Emma said for about the hundredth time. She was looking at me, but not seeing me and not meaning what she was saying either. He's going, my aunt said. She was definitely seeing me. Mr. Henry won't come to him. Oh, yes. I keep forgetting that, I said. Mr. Henry won't come to me. After a minute of grunting and straining, they were able to get out of the car. I followed them into the inner yard up the stairs to the back door. The maid, Inez Lane, had seen us come into the yard and she opened the door for us. Inez was in her early forties, I suppose. She wore a white dress, white shoes, a blue gingham apron, and a kerchief on her head. She had a dark mole on her left cheek. She nodded to my aunt and me and spoke to Miss Emma. I heard she said, she said, I would like to speak to Mr. Henry if he's home, Miss Emma said. Talking to Mr. Lewis in the library, Inez said. Like to speak to him if you don't mind, Miss Emma said. Inez nodded and left us. I looked around the kitchen. I had come into this kitchen many times as a small child to bring in wood for the stove, to bring in a chicken I had caught and killed, eggs I had found in the grass and figs, pears, and pecans I had gathered from the tree in the yard. Miss Emma was the cook up here then. She wore the white dress and the white shoes and the kerchief around her head. She had been here long before I was born, probably when my mother and father were children. She had cooked for the old Picos, the parents of Henry Pico. She had cooked for Henry and his brother and sister, as well as for his nieces and nephews. He did not have any children of his own. She cooked, she ran the house. My aunt washed and ironed, and I ran through the yard to get things they needed to cook or cook with. As a child growing up on this plantation, I could not imagine this place, this house, existing without the two of them here. 
But before I left for the university, my aunt sat me down at the table in our kitchen and said to me, me and Emma can make all out all right without you coming through that back door ever again. I had not come through that back door once since leaving for the university 10 years before. I'd been teaching on the place going on six years and I had not been in Pico's yard, let alone gone back, gone up the back stairs or through that back door. I saw both my aunt and Miss Emma looking around the kitchen. Some things had changed since they left. Others had not. The big black iron pot still hung against the wall, but the wood-burning oven that I had known and that they had known had been exchanged for a gas range and a big white refrigerator had taken the place of a smaller ice box. The war had changed all that. After so many of the young colored men had gone into military service or left the plantation, there was no one to chop the wood or, and haul the ice. And when they left, so did the old people, my aunt and Miss Emma. I did not hear Inez knock on the library door or hear her call, but I did hear Henry Pico's voice. Yes, Inez, what is it? And then a moment later, who? And a moment after that, did she say what she wanted? And later, go back there and ask her what she wants. Inez came back into the kitchen just tell him I like to speak to him, Miss Emma said. It's important. Inez started back up the hall, but Henry Pico had already left the library. He was a medium-sized man of medium weight. He wore a gray suit, a white shirt, and a gray and white striped tie. He could have been in his mid-sixties. His hair was white and long. He held a drink. Louis Rugon, who followed him into the kitchen, was taller, heavier, and maybe a year or two younger. He wore a black pinstripe suit, and he also held a drink. Louis Rugon's people owned a bank in St. Adrian, a small town about 15 miles west of Henry Pico's plantation. Mr. Henry, Mr. Louis, Miss Emma spoke to them. My aunt nodded. I didn't. I stood back near the door. What can I do for you, Emma? Pico asked her. He seemed annoyed that he had been disturbed while he had company. I want to ask you a favor, Mr. Henry, Miss Emma said. He drank from his glass and looked at her. It's Jefferson, she said. Yes, I heard, he said, and waited. I want to ask you a favor. I can't change what has been handed down by the court, he said. I spoke up before the trial. I can't say any more. Yes, sir, she said. But that's not what I come to ask you for. I come to ask you something else. Miss Emma looked tired. She was tired. She wanted to sit down at the table, but no one had offered her a chair. My aunt put her arm around her shoulders to comfort her and help her stand. I looked at the two white men who raised their glasses. Henry Pico finished his drink and stuck out his hand. Inez knew what that meant, and she came forward to get the empty glass. Then she turned to Louis Rugon, who had stuck out his glass, empty of everything except two or three small cubes of ice. She took the glasses to a liquor counter to refresh the drinks. They called my boy a hog, Mr. Henry, Miss Emma said. I didn't raise no hog, and I don't want no hog to go set in that chair. I want a man to go set in that chair, Mr. Henry. He looked at her, but he didn't say anything. He was waiting for his drink. I'm old, Mr. Henry, she went on. Jefferson gonna need me, but I'm too old to be going up there. My heart won't take it. I want you talk to the sheriff for me. I want somebody else to take my place. That's up to you and Mr. Sam, isn't it? Pico said. And he took the drink off the tray that Inez held before him. I need you to speak for me, Mr. Henry. And Miss Emma said, I want the teacher to visit my boy. I want the, te the teacher make him know he's not a hog. He's a man. I want him to know that before he go to that chair, Mr. Henry. Henry Pico glanced at me, then looked back at her. I done done a lot for this family and this place, Mr. Henry, she said. All I'm asking you talk to the sheriff for me. I done done a lot for this family over the years. I can't promise anything, he said, and sipped his drink. You can speak to your brother-in-law and say what? I want the teacher to talk to my boy for me. He looked over her head at me. 
standing back by the door. I was too educated for Henry Pico. He had no use for me at all anymore. But just as Miss Emma had given so much of herself to that family, so had my aunts. So Henry Pico, who cared nothing in the world for me, tolerated me because of my aunt. And what do you plan to do? He asked me. I shook my head. I have no idea. He stared at me, and I realized that I had not answered him in the proper manner. Sir, I added, you think you can change him from a hog to a man in the little time he's got left? I have no idea, sir, I said. But you're willing to try, if I can get Mr. Sam to let you go up there. That's what she wants, sir. But you didn't put her up to this? No, sir, I did not. He was finished talking to me. Now he wanted me to look away. I lowered my eyes. When I raised my head, I saw his eyes on her again. I would forget all this if I were you, he said. Let Mosey visit him and keep it at that. Reverend Mosey will visit him, Miss Emma said. But no, sir, I won't keep it at that. At this point, I would be more concerned about his soul if I were you, Henry said. Yes, sir. I'm concerned for his soul, Mr. Henry, Emma said. I'm concerned for his soul, but I want him to be a man too when he'd go to that chair. Louis Rugon, standing next to Henry Pico, held his drink without drinking. He could not believe what he was hearing. Henry Pico looked at me again. He was sure I'd put her up to this. I shifted my eyes and I didn't look in his direction until I heard him speaking to her. Go on home. Forget all this foolishness, he told her. You have done all you could to raise him. Let the law have him now. The law got him, Mr. Henry, Miss Emma said. And they gonna kill him. But let them kill a man. Let the teacher go to him, Mr. Henry. I done done a lot for this family over the years. I know what you've done for this family over the years, he told her. And I also know what he did. Or have you forgotten that? I ain't forgotten nothing, Mr. Henry, she said. I know what they said he did. He did it, Henry said, leaving no doubt in his mind. I spoke for him because of you. But all the time I knew he did it. If you say so, Mr. Henry... I say so, he said. That's not what I come up here for, Mr. Henry, Miss Emma said to him. I'm not begging for his life no more. That's over. I just want to see him die like a man. This family owe me that much, Mr. Henry, and I want it. I want somebody to do something for me one time before I close my eyes. Somebody got to do something for me one time before I close my eyes, Mr. Henry. Please, sir. From where I stood, back by the door, I could see my aunt tightening her grip around Miss Emma's shoulders to give her comfort. I'll speak to him, Henry said. But it's up to him, not me. Tell him what I done for this family, Mr. Henry. Tell him to ask his wife all I done for this family over the years. I said I would speak to him, Henry said, obviously becoming more and more impatient with her. When, she asked. Henry Pico had started to raise his glass because for him, the conversation was over. But when Miss Emma spoke again, his hand stopped inches away from his mouth and he lowered the glass. What? When? Whenever I see him, that's when, he said. Now, if you don't mind, I have a guest. He drank and turned away. Mr. Henry, Miss Emma called him, but he kept walking. I'll be up here again tomorrow, Mr. Henry. I'll be on my knees next time you see me, Mr. Henry but she was speaking to empty space. Henry Pico and Louis Rugon were already in the library. Miss, Hen Miss Emma continued to stare up the hall for a moment. Then she and my aunt turned away and I held the door open for them to go outside. The sun had gone down and it was getting colder. <laughs>